I'm joined with Todd Newell from Oceaneering. We're here at the Oceaneering stand at Offshore Europe. So we've heard a lot about the Freedom product here. Could you tell us a little bit about it and how it works? The Freedom vehicle, it's a, um, it's a subseat robot. It's a configurable robot, which means we can change the configuration to meet different kinds of uh, applications. Its uh, primary business value is to be subsea resident to where it can do work that today you have to have a, a topside uh, surface vessel with a conventional ROV. This allows you to do the work without having to have the vessel. So it uh, has two major benefits to that is, you know, it's definitely a cost reduction. Uh, also has a much lower uh, carbon footprint than because you're not needing that, that service vessel running those engines, you know, creating CO2. So it does uh, primary task would be to do uh, inspection, um, which makes up about 40% of uh, subsea work for robots. It does have a, some tooling capabilities to where it can interact with subsea assets. It can operate three different ways. It, it is an autonomous robot, so you know it can do things cognitively, uh, thinking for itself, or it can be in uh, supervisory control mode where there's a person overseeing but not piloting, which basically means the robot has to wait for the person to authorize the next movement as a safety precaution. And then it can be piloted just like an ROV is, is piloted today. But it's very important that uh, to maximize the value proposition is for it to be able to operate untethered because it, it, that's, that's really key in order to have enough range to get around without having the, the, the service vessel. So you touched on a few great points there. Is there anything else that makes this different from standard ROVs? Well, a standard ROV, a work-class ROV, has a lot of horsepower because it's, a, it, it's intended to be a universal machine that's used throughout the life of field. So, it, you know, it's utilized in the early exploration phases all the way through decommissioning. The, the two big work phases were, that require the horsepower of the machine are really during uh, the construction phase and during the drilling phase. The other phases, there's a lot of the activity doesn't really require that much power. So this machine uh, probably gets used a lot more during the, uh, the, the production side of Life of Field, where it's doing the uh, subsea uh, IMR, which is inspection, maintenance, and repair work, that doesn't quite require the horsepower. Um, that's kind of the differences between the two. And can you tell us about the range for Freedom? It's a, the range of the vehicle is very important. It took a while for us to, um, to get the right size of the battery system in order to maximize how much distance could be covered. The endurance of this machine is, is around uh, 200 kilometers, which means it can cover a lot of uh, territory in order to provide the inspection work, particularly in the North Sea, both on the Nor Norwegian side and on the UK side. There's a lot of subsea assets that are close to each other. So a machine like this can, can be a resident subsea in a docking station and then consider it like daily milk runs. It could be making runs out to inspect uh, pipelines, trees, manifolds, uh, uh, flying uh, production risers, basically doing all that work that's done today by sending vessels from shore. So uh, it's, just, it's a definitely a big change in the way the industry will do their work in the future, uh, but it's, it's doable. Great, it definitely sounds really exciting. A lot of key benefits for the industry, which will hopefully help to transform the way things are being done. Well, good luck with the product, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thanks for the interview.